Amen. Touch your neighbor. Say, good thing pastor ain't preaching today. You may return to your seat. Landon Gore, we're glad you're in the house. Would you make him welcome? Love you, buddy. Better hug this time. <laughs> can you clap your hands one more time unto the Lord this morning? Come on, can you stand to your feet just one more time? And would you just give God great praise in this house right now? Would you do it? Come on, would you give him thanksgiving? Would you give him gratitude for all that he has done? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What a joy it is to be back with the Tampa Life family. And I'm so grateful for what the Lord has done through this local assembly, through this household of faith, through this body of believers. And I don't know if you know this, um, but I have heard that in and out is coming near or maybe perhaps here in Tampa Life sometime next year. Has anybody else heard that? Am I operating in the prophetic? I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to speak that by faith. I've heard a rumor that it's coming next year. I'm just going to, I'm just going to speak faith on top of that rumor. Um, I have in and out about 20 minutes from my apartment and, uh, well, had a little travel mess up and my car, uh, I was at my apartment. My car was not at my apartment and I'm in Dallas without my car and I'm, I'm hungry. It's late at night. I just need an in and out burger. It's 20 minutes away. So I Uber from my own apartment in my own city uh, to in and out It was the slowest Uber in the history of Ubering. I'm watching my ETA as it is now bumping up against the closing time of in and out They are closing and we are going to get there 60 seconds before they close. And then we hit a red light. And I was like, do I convince him to run it? And he runs the red light without me even asking. I think he was sensing an urgency coming from the back seat. I said, what a plot twist. We go five miles an hour the entire trip only to run a red light at the end. Started questioning my whole existence. <laughs> And uh, so the lights are turning off as we come into the parking lot. And I'm thinking, do I, do I just turn around now? Because I kind of Uber back. This is going to be really awkward if I walk to the door and my Uber is gone. And now I'm Ubering again. And so I said, no, I, I'm getting a burger. So as I'm running up to the door, an in and out employee is walking to the door. And he leans down and he goes to lock the door. And life is flashing before me. Hunger pains are increasing. A double-double is about to be a distant memory. And then he walks away. I barge through. I said, can I be y'all's last customer? He said, yes. I said, I thought you were coming to lock the door. He said, I was. I said, why didn't you lock the door? He said, I didn't. I, 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 I forgot the key. Oh, y'all don't want to know my testimony. <laughs> I learned a very valuable lesson. I was reminded of something very simplistic, but uh, revelatory in my brain. Uh, you can't lock a door without a key. You know how many times we come into the house of God and the adversary has convinced us that we cannot ascertain what we have come for in the spirit and he has somehow seduced us into believing that he has the authority to decide whether we walk into what God has already opened before us. I just need to remind the devil and his demonic forces, you do not have the jurisdiction. You do not even have the keys to your own house, much less what God has prepared for those that love him. So I'm just intrinsically convinced that God's opened up the door, a door today. 
I believe there is a door open in the spirit. I have watched as men and women already in this worship atmosphere have been taking steps. I say we just walk through the threshold. I say we just walk past that open door today. Amen. Would you go with me very quickly to the word of God, to the book of 2 uh, Kings, 2 Kings chapter 3. The book of 2 Kings chapter 3. I will begin at verse 8. Um, I'm so grateful for the resilience of this church, for the faithfulness of this church as God has sustained you through the events of the last few weeks. And I'm so grateful um, to come back and be with family. And if I need to remind you, we are family. Um, and if I need to remind you, if you don't like me, if you don't love me, I told you, I don't care. Like, I'm not bothered. It's a hostage situation. So every time I come back to Temple Life, I feel like I'm coming back to be with family. And I'm so grateful uh, for you, my brothers and my sisters. And I'm so grateful for the Tisdale family. How many of you are thankful for Pastor Robert, his wife, and their children? I love you so much. 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 8. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through. Someone say the way through. The way through the, way through the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went, the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water. Someone say, no water. For the host and for the cattle that followed them, and the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord has called these three kings together only to deliver them unto their enemy, the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat, you thought you didn't like your name. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of him? And and one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom, they went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get you to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. And the king of Israel said, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, if it were not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not even talk to you. The prophet is not in a good mood right now if you cannot discern that. He said, Bring me a musician. And it came to pass that when the musician began to play, that the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches, for thus saith the Lord, You will not see wind. Someone say, You won't see wind. And you won't see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water that you may drink. Both you and your cattle and your beasts, and this is simply a light thing in the sight of the Lord. I feel faith in this house right now. I feel a witness of the Word of God in this room right now. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the way out is through. Turn to your other neighbor, the one you just rejected. Apologize and tell them the way out is through. One more time, as a crescendo of faith, would you just lift up your hands? Would you lift up your voice? And would you thank God? Come on, every hand raised, every eye closed. Would you just thank the Lord for what he's getting ready to do in this house? I bless you, Jesus. I honor you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I thank you for what you have done and for what you are yet to accomplish. Let it be so. Somebody say in Jesus' name. You may be seated this morning. They are an army that are equipped. They are trained for battle. They are ready for war. They are making their way towards a common enemy. They are united in their desire for domination and dominion. However, there is a slight problem. They are seven days into their journey, and now they are in the middle of the dry, arid desert, and there is no water. What an insult. They have weaponry. They have 
training. They have battle brothers beside them, and yet they are weary in their body and in their mind because there is no water around them. It is quite possible that they are about to die, not by the hands of their enemy, but because of the desert that is not supplying nourishment to them. It is going to be their epitaph that they simply did not have any water, so they died in the desert. So it is, there is a grumbling, there is a murmuring, there is a doubt that is spreading and beginning to suffocate their spirit until one singular person speaks up and says, what if, what if we got a word from heaven? What if our life was not supposed to go by what appears to be, but what if our life was going to go by what is appointed to be? Maybe, just maybe, if we heard a word from heaven, our plight could change. Because as believers, we are not limited by reality. But we live with design, with divine possibility. The language of faith says just maybe God can do something beyond what we see in the physical right now. Is there anybody, is there anybody that we could get a hold of? And somebody said there is a prophet. And this prophet has street cred. He has credentials. He, he's not just any prophet. He has poured water on the hands of Elijah. He has served. And so now, now they, they begin to look for this prophet. And the miracle to me is that they find him. They are in a desert place. So now I need to ask you what the prophet is doing in the desert. And now maybe it will make sense why the prophet is not in a good mood. I don't think he's fighting spiritual warfare. I think he's hangry. I think he's annoyed. He is a prophet in the desert. But the desert did not call you, so the desert cannot uncall you. Your circumstance did not qualify you, so your circumstance cannot disqualify you. Your situation does not give merit alone to your anointing, so your situation cannot strip your anointing from you. So I must ask you, what happens if the prophet stops prophesying simply because he's in a desert place? Well, it looks like he is not in the mood to prophesy because they come to him and he does not engage them with empathy. He says, get back to your mom, get back to your dad. I know your hypocrisy. I, I, I know your mistakes. I know who you are. I don't want to speak to nobody. He is not anointed. He is annoyed. He is not in a good mood. But he is dealing with men who are desperate. He, are, he is dealing with an entire army that is going to die without intervention from the other world, from the supernatural realm. And they said, you don't understand. You don't understand. We, we are not going to die here. He says, all right. I don't respect you. <laughs> I told you. Prophet is savage. He said, I don't respect you. I don't respect you. I don't want to talk to anybody. But because I respect Jehoshaphat, I'm going to try to get a word from heaven. Some of you don't even realize your family is blessed, not because your family is spiritual, but because you are spiritual. Some of you don't realize, but your business and the place where you work is favored, not because the culture is Christ-like, but because you are Christ-like. God just needs one of his beloved sons or daughters in a situation to bless and favor beyond themselves. 
Prophet said, I ain't going to talk to any of you, but I, but I, I can't ignore Jehoshaphat. I have regard. I have, I have respect. So he said, all right, bring me a musician. That's the other miracle. What is a musician doing in the desert? <laughs> and what happens if the musician says, I'm hanging up my harp. I refuse to sing because I did not sign up for the desert. And the Bible says that as the musician begins to play, that the hand of the Lord begins to move. You missed it. When human hands begin to move, heavenly hands begin to move. When finite hands begin to move, infinite hands begin to move. So I got to ask you another question. If the psalmist doesn't sing... In the desert, then the prophet doesn't get a word in the desert, and a shovel doesn't fall in the desert, and then an army dies in the desert. I gotta say it again because uh, the shovels are trying to tag team with me. If the musician doesn't play, and sing in the desert. The prophet doesn't get a word in the desert, and then an army dies in the desert. This is bigger than you. 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 What if the desert is not about you? See, the atmosphere is going to have to change. Jared, I need your help. I need a few guys with Jared. I need your help. Here, here's, here's why the atmosphere is going to have to change. Uh, because the prophet... Uh, the prophet gets the word, run up here. Y'all run up here, run up here. Run, 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 run. Run in the Hebrew means run. <laughs> Y'all grab a shovel, grab a shovel. Don't hurt nobody. Move away slowly from the LED screen. Everyone's got a shovel. Here is why the atmosphere has got to change. Because the prophet has a word. But my man must be glitching. He must still be thirsty because this word is not the word we need. <laughs> tell the prophet we need another word. Uh, tell, the pro tell the prophet we are unsubscribing. Um, tell the prophet uh, we need the receipt. Take it back. We want a new word. This is the word. Make this valley full of ditches. Are you underwhelmed? Because I am underwhelmed. They are, what an insult. They are already in a low place. But you know what God is telling them? Turn a low place into a deep place. Ah, that's what the adversary wants you to see. Through a filter of doubt and doom and decadence. And, but when you're spiritual eyes begin to open you realize that you are not just in a low place you are in a deep place and you have the ability to go deeper and deeper and deeper and what you thought was shallowness can actually segue into depth <laughs> but they don't believe it quite yet they are Warriors who are drained and fatigued and they are being told, put down your sword and pick up a shovel. So this is why the musician has to play. Jeremy, I want you to just play a little bit. Just play a little bit. I need you to take a shovel and I need you to turn this low place into a deep place. You, you feel the atmosphere change? Even I didn't want to hear that first word. But when I speak it out, something in my heart begins to want to acquiesce. Something in my heart wants to shape and mold towards what if? What if I had the ability to take this death, to take this disease, to take this turmoil, to take this unexpected situation that I did not RSVP for? What if I could take a shovel? What if I could see with supernatural eyes? Whew, I feel the spirit. 
And what if I could turn this low place into a deep place? Watch, you got to hear it. Keep playing, Jeremy. And now somebody's standing a little taller. Now the prophet is getting up from the rock that he's been sitting on. And now the musician's playing a little louder. And the prophet says, thus saith the Lord. I want you to put verse 16 up there if you can. Make this valley. Someone say this valley. He said, make this valley full of ditches. But then in the next verse, this is what it says. This is where the word of God continues. He said, that valley. Okay, wait. Wait, go back, go back. Verse 16, we, we got to read this again. Where's all, my, where's all my fact checkers at? He said, make this valley. Someone say this valley. Go to verse 17. <laughs> You're not going to see wind. You're not going to see rain. But that valley. Someone say that valley. It's almost as if God is in this moment. And it's as if God is already in the next moment. It's as if God is saying, make this valley full of ditches. And then in the next verse, he's saying that valley. Wouldn't it be like God to be in the valley with you and yet being on, on the other side of the valley waiting on you? And God doesn't wait in vain. I said God doesn't wait in vain. So if he's on the outside of the valley waiting for you, he intends for you to make it through the despondency, through the pain, through the grief, through the trauma. There's some days I need to know that God is with me. And if he's not with me, I'm going to lose my mind. But there's other days that I don't feel like he's with me. Oh, the proximity is there. He, he's, he's close by, but he's not right here. I thought he was here when I went to service and I felt him. He was so tangible, but it's as if he's close and it's as if he's there, but not here. And I don't want him there. I want him right here. But some days my faith is solidified and my faith becomes more robust when I realize he's, he's waiting on me. He's waiting on me. If he's waiting on me, he intends for me to make it. If he's in the valley with me, but on the outside of the valley waiting on me, he believes I can make it. See, sometimes we have to pivot our paradigm. We, 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 we trust in God. And I believe that. But sometimes we mitigate the fact that God is trusting in us. God believes in me. Watch. I don't know who, somebody over here was already trying to preach my message. I need you to chill right now. Put it back up there. You're not going to see wind. You're not going to see rain. Here's the words for somebody. God knows how to bring water without bringing a storm. In the spiritual, sometimes my proclivity is to believe that if God is going to bless me, he's going to have to do it through another storm. And we know that God can leverage storms. You know just a little bit about stewarding storms. But what if God were to say, I'm getting ready to bless you, but I don't need wind to bring it, and I don't need rain to bring it. God wants to test you. But don't ever forget, God wants to bless you too. Have we become so accustomed to storms in the spirit that we believe that God can only bring blessing through pain? I know God wants to bless me, but I don't know if I can brace myself for another storm. Oh, I'm just being real. 
what if? What if? I'm just saying, what if? God said, water's coming, but you're not going to see rain. And you're not going to see wind. Because I don't always make sense. I make miracles. And this time, the water is not coming from above you. This time, the water is going to flow from beneath you. That means it was already there. (laughs) I just need somebody to agree in their spirit for just a moment. I just need someone to lift their hands, clap your hands, lift your voice, whatever you need to do. I, I just need you to agree in the spirit. Water's coming to my mind. Water's coming to my family. Water's coming to my health. Water's coming to my home. Water's coming to Tampa Life. Woo! What? I, I, I know I said it to you. I, I just want to say it to the spirit world for just a minute. Water's coming. Water's coming. There's a rippling in the spirit. It doesn't have to be a hurricane. It doesn't have to be a storm. It doesn't have to be traumatic. I just happen to believe that peaceful water, still water, is coming from the glory world. Here's why. Vessels and valleys have the same shape. And I didn't know when I walked into the valley I was going to walk out a vessel. Because he said this water is not to drown you. It's not to overwhelm you. It's that you may drink. So the deeper you go, the more capacity you have. Oh, you don't understand. It's just a low place. I'm preaching to someone over here in this section. It's, you, you think, oh, no, it's just a low place. Emptiness with you is emptiness. But emptiness with him is potential. Emptiness with me is just mere emptiness. But with him, it is capacity. This is not where I die. This is where I become deadly. This is where I start going a little deeper in sanctification. This is where I start going a little deeper in discipleship. And this is where I start going a little deeper in my faith. And this this is not where I die. This is where a ministry is born. This is where a God dream came. This is where I begin to take, partake of overflowing water. This is what I need you to do. I need you to, I need you to take a cup. Take a cup. Hurry, hurry. We, we, water's, water's here. Water's here. We've been weary. We, we thought we were going to die here. I need you to, I need you to, I need you to take a drink, take a drink, take a drink. Water, we didn't know it was coming. We, we didn't believe it could come. We, we thought we were going to die in the desert. But, but he has the ability to make rivers in the desert so take a drink take a drink take a drink go back and read it this is what their adversary saw their adversary saw the water but they didn't see water you know what the adversary saw the adversary saw a mirage The adversary didn't see water. The adversary saw bloodshed. And this is what the adversary said. They have imploded. They have turned against each other. And now we don't even need to kill them. They have killed themselves. This is what the adversary said. They're fighting, Jared. Let's fight. Oh, this is an unfair fight. Oh, okay, okay, all right. 
It's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. Oh, okay. You, you coming at me? But it was a rumor. It was a rumor. Take another drink. This is what they were doing. The enemy saw bloodshed. But what they did not know is as they got closer and closer, they were getting ready to face a hydrated army. But the sun had begun to shine. And when it glistened off the water, it created a mirage for the enemy. So before you curse the sun for causing your dry place, it will be the sun that begins to work on your behalf and confuse the enemy in your favor. Stand with me. He was a world-renowned sniper. His name was Carlos Hathcock. He had over 90 kills in the Vietnam War. Carlos was quite a man. You could probably preach about his whole life. The stories are literally unbelievable. One such story that I came across was Carlos got in a little competition with an opposing Viet Cong communist sniper. The tales of Carlos had gotten into their camp and so now they were literally seeking each other out to prove who was the best. At one point they were literally bipolar opposite of each other. And in their search for one another they literally switched sides. Until one day, Carlos was convinced that he had him in his scope, but he couldn't see anything. The sun was so blinding. But then as he began to peer a little closer, there was a little glint off a of metal. And all Carlos Hathcock did was simply pull the trigger. He didn't know what had happened. He didn't know if it was a confirmed kill shot. He didn't know if his enemy was defeated but as he made his way closer he realized it was indeed a confirmed kill his bullet had went through the scope of his adversary straight through his eye which meant that Carlos Hathcock was also in his sight Carlos just pulled the trigger first and he only pulled the trigger because the son was working on his behalf. Some of you don't even realize the adversary does have you in his crosshairs. But while the adversary thinks he has you, God has you. Some of you are going to have a miracle story in this season, in this week, in this month. And you know what your simple explanation is going to be? It was my intellect. No. It was my prowess. It was my skill set. It's because I'm an Enneagram 8. No. God has me. God has me. It doesn't make sense. But God has me. God has me. God has me. I have to end with this. I want to be cognizant of the time. But I need to, I need to put this into your spirit. Genesis 37. Genesis 37, 23. It's a word for somebody. It's, it's literally the word. I'm giving you the word of God. Genesis 37. Musicians and singers come. Genesis 37, 23 says, And it came to pass when Joseph was come to his brothers that they robbed him of his coat. His coat of many colors. His coat of favor. And they took him and they put him into a pit. 
And the Bible says there was no water in it. So it wasn't just a pit. It was a well. But wells become prisons when no water is flowing. I'm in the... I'm, I'm, I'm in a pit. No, you're in a well without water. And you can only be held hostage until the water begins to flow. Watch. One more. One more verse. I got to read it to you. Genesis 49. Genesis 49 and 22. Genesis 49 and 22. Joseph is a fruitful branch. By a well whose branches exceed. Some of you right now are asking, how are you going to get out of it? You are not going to get out of it. You're going to grow out of it. That's the word. So I'm done. But here's what I need you to do. If the enemy's put a sword in your hand, I need you to let go of the sword. Because we're not fighting each other. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. If the spirit has placed murmuring or negativity into your hands, let it go. Pick up a shovel. Because your shovel is about to be your greatest weapon. Because you're about to turn a low place into a deep place. And what the adversary doesn't want you to know is there may not be any water right now. But if you can just dig a little deeper, you're not just in the bottom of a valley. You're on top of a riverbed. And sometimes you got to take a shovel and you got to say, wake up. Wake up. And if you don't wake up, I'm going to dig you up because I may not get out of this. But I will grow beyond this. So would you do that? Would you just take a shovel in the spirit and would you step out from where you are right now? And would you join me as a family in this altar right now? Would you do that? Would you bring your spouse? Would you bring your babies? Would you bring a friend? Would you bring a battle brother? Would you bring a sister? Come on, just simply you taking them by the hand, just simply you putting your arm around them. You, you don't know how much faith you are about to project into their spirit. Come on, that's it. Come on, Tampa Life. I see it. Come on, I'm calling you by your name this morning. Not Tampa defeated. You're Tampa Life. You're Tampa Life. And I feel life getting ready to rush through this house. I feel a bubbling over in the spirit right now. Woo! Come on, I see it. This is so beautiful. People are still coming. If you're in the front, come a little closer. Come a little closer. There's people coming into the aisle. There's people cascading behind you. We want to make room for everybody. There's those that are watching online. Come on. <laughs> you walked into a valley, but you're walking out a vessel. You thought you were going to die here, but this is where you're going to become deadly. You thought you were in a pit, but you're in a well, and water's about to flow, and branches are getting ready to exceed. Now all across this house as a family, would you close your eyes?